Tonight, it could be you. In 2002, Utah hosted the Winter Olympic Games. Now, we had lost, actually, the bid for the 1998 Games. It was a very painful moment. Uh, I was governor uh, in 2002, or rather, in, in, I had been elected governor, and we concluded we need to do this again. It would be great for the economy of our state, it would be good for our brand, and we concluded to continue forward. But the stakes are very high, and the competition is high, and the bid processing process is just grueling. Uh, you first have to win the U.S. bid against numerous cities who are interested in becoming the host city. Then you, enter, then you compete internationally, and it's literally eight years of drama. But finally, in June of 1995, we were in Budapest, Hungary. We had presented to the International Olympic Committee, and we were waiting inside an auditorium for the results. Now, back in Utah, there was 150,000 people who had gathered not far from where we sit today, watching a gigantic video screen that was connected to this auditorium. Now, there were three other cities who had also competed, who were equally hopeful, and where a similar scene was unfolding in their cities. So we're looking at four video screens, knowing that one of the four will be jubilant and the other three will be disappointed. Now, this is a very rare moment for a state, for everyone in the state to be focused on the very same thing, to have their heart level, heart rate level elevated at the same moment and for the same reason, the same joint purpose that we had held for eight years, it was a very big moment. Suddenly on the side of the stage, a door opened, and in walked Juan Antonio, Antonio Samaranch, who was the, the, the chairman of the International Olympic Committee. Every member of the committee streamed in first, and, and Samaranch came in last. He went straight to the podium. At that point, my heart just pounded. And do you know that feeling that you get when it's sort of dizzy, surreal feeling when something's going to happen? It just swept over me and I think everyone else in the room. I'll just let you watch. Well, the International Olympic Committee has decided to award the organization of the 19th Olympic Winter Games in 2002 to the city of Salt Lake City. woman jumping on the table was a gold medal uh, skier named Peekaboo Street. All I remember about the next several minutes were hugs and tears and awe. As you might expect, the plane ride back to Salt Lake City was a wonderful, exhilarating moment. But what often seems in this life starts out as exhilaration, ultimately turns to worry and the weight of responsibility. <laughs> And by the time we got home, it had all settled in. And well, the next seven years, let's just say the, from the phrase, the city of Salt Lake City to let the games begin was not nearly that much fun. Uh, in fact, there were highs and there were lows. There were scandals and leadership changes. I, I brought in an executive who at that time was not well known that many of you will probably recognize now. The games themselves were three glorious weeks. Um, they were successful in every way. Uh, but when the athletes were gone and the banners were down, uh, the lasting benefit of it has to be the lessons that we learned and the relationships that we built. 
the things that happen when you go through hard times. I think it was Mark Twain who once said that a man who carries a cat by the tail learns lessons he will learn in no other way. <laughs> there was a bit of cat holding in, in this experience. But I, I tell you tonight, today a, a, an Olympic story for two reasons. One is that this evening we'll be at Olympic Park, and I think it's a place of history and some context around the meaning of it uh, will be valuable as some of you uh, move through the Olympic event yourself. I also use it because today we're here to talk about a series of matters related to value, the first one being risk. And I'd like to talk today about risk and lessons that we learned that I think are applicable. As you know, uh, Levitt Partners, has an ongoing project of analyzing 750 organizations who are involved in value-based care in some way. We want to know why they succeed, we want to know why they fail. In the next 20 minutes, I want to talk about five key attributes that we have identified that are present in organizations who successfully navigate the transition between fee-for-service and risk-based payment. And I want to use an, a, an Olympic experience, or at least an, an experience that happened during our preparation time as a metaphor to help illustrate them. Uh, during the seven years that we were preparing, there was a lot going on in our state. Uh, Utah was exploding in population. And so we had growth problems. And to understand that, you, you really just need to spend an hour in this. And, and you will understand. Now, just to orient you geographically, let me point out that, that this is Utah. Uh, Utah, 88% of Utah lives in this particular area you see in yellow. It's often referred to as the crossroads of the West, and here's the reason. You have highways that converge there. It is literally in the geog geographic center. Now, what you will see in a very small box is that there are 17 miles where every month 5 million cars use that 17 miles. The convergence of major interstate highways and the population center of this particular state. Experts said that the, the traffic problems during that time were actually worse than in Los Angeles at rush hour. The highways were narrow, they were old, they were dangerous. The truth is, they simply had to be replaced. Now, I asked for a plan to be developed to fix them. This is basically what I was told. There are 17 miles that need to be replaced. In that 17 miles, there's 130 overpasses. They all have to be torn down. There are eight urban interchanges and three interstate freeway junctions where major interstates come together. And we can't just repair them, we have to replace them because they are two lanes wide now and they need to be six. How long will it take, I ask? Well, we're looking at 10 to 12 years, best case. Why? Well, we have to divide it into 20 separate contracts because that's about how much cons construction can be done at any given time, and it will cost about $2 billion. So I had a conversation that said well, something like this. So you're telling me that we're going to tear up this, this 17 miles, which is the center of all commerce, not just here, but in many cases in the interior west. We're going to leave it that way for 10 years, and in the middle of that, we will host the Winter Olympic Games. Uh, I, from there, walked back into my office, um, and I met the per uh, talked with the person that I'd like to say is the hero in this story. I'd like you to meet Tom Warren. Now, Tom Warren was a 40-year-old engineer who I had hired to be the head of the Department of Transportation. Uh, a very thoughtful man and an extraordinary leader. So we went back into a small office behind the governor's formal office, and I said to him, Tom, this just isn't going to work. 
you can't close down a state for 10 years with highway construction and then hold the Olympics in the middle of it. We have got to come up with a different solution. He said to me, I have an idea, give me two weeks. So two weeks later, we had another meeting. And his first words to me were, have you ever heard the phrase design build? I said, I've heard it, I have no idea what it means. Well, he said, first let's start with, it's totally different than what we do today. Now, what we did at that point, and what most highway con uh, construction projects entail, is that the state's engineers design the road and develop a set of specifications that are extraordinarily granular. They go so far as to say how many yards, how many cubic yards of dirt will be hauled, where they will be put, and how many times a steamroller needs to go over the road to compact them. Then everything, at every step, is inspected and approved by state inspectors. Any charge that comes on top of that then is basically additional. So any change, rather. So it, more dirt, more money. Now, I must tell you that the truth is contractors really like this system because they have figured out how to make money under this system. You get the contract at as low as price as you have to, and then you make money on change orders as you add and change the contract. So if you've ever wondered why it is that most contracts are over budget and over time, it's because the system is dependent upon innumerable numbers of change orders that run the price up. Uh, it's also then important to rec recognize that that's the reason we have so many inspectors around. It is a very bureaucratic process. The more dirt you move, the more you get paid, the more pavement you lay, the more that you get. It is very similar to a fee-for-service system. I said, okay, Tom, I understand what we do now, but help me understand design-build. Under design-build, he said, the state and the contractor are going to agree on a series of outcomes and quality standards. And then we're going to sign a contract under which the contractor will design and build the road. But the contractor must design and build a road that meets the outcomes and the quality standards. The simplicity of it, he said, will dramatically cut the costs and the time. So I said, what happens if the contractor builds it on the cheap? Here's the big difference, he said. You've asked the right question. The big difference is we're going to shift the risk from the state to the contractor. We're going to, rather than micromanage the specs and, the, and every step of the process, we're going to require that the contractor provide us with a 15-year warranty. In other words, if the contractor cuts a corner, the contractor ultimately pays when it comes to maintenance. If the contractor develops an unsafe design, the contractor will ultimately pay when there is a lawsuit. But a couple of other differences, he said. The first is, you remember I suggested we needed 20 contracts? In this concept, I want one contract, and I want one contractor, and I want an, it to be integrated, I want it to be coordinated, one could say, I want there to be an accountable contractor organization. <laughs> now, there's one other thing he said. In fact, he said there's two other things. We may not award this to the lowest bidder. We must award it to the contractor who presents the best value. And secondly, I want to put $50 million into incentives. And if the contractor can meet our priorities, I want to pay, him the pay them the entire $50 million. And then he said, what are your priorities, Governor? I said, easy question. I want it done on time. 
and I want motorists to be happy. It wasn't lost on me that I was running for re-election in the middle of this. <laughs> I said, okay, how long is it going to take? If you turn me loose, he said, I'll get this done in less than five years and I'll finish it before the Olympics and we'll do it for less than two billion dollars. I said, who's done this before? He said, it's been done with buildings, but no one's ever done it with highways. And then he smiled and said, I think we should be the first. Now, I must tell you, this was a moment of serious risk for me. There was no easy solution. We were weighing between the risk of tearing up freeways for, tw uh, for 12 years and having the Olympics in the middle and having 20 contractors and the potential of big overruns and, and time. Or we could choose with something that hadn't been done before. One contractor, aligned incentives, innovation and, and, and incentives aligned, and finishing in five years. Over the next few months, I studied this hard as you would. Uh, I tested it with many different people, and we began to build political support for it and ultimately con con concluded, let's do it. So I went on television, and this is basically the conversation I had with the people of our state. I said, we need to do a hard thing together. And when we're done, life will be better. But you know that freeway that you use every day? We need to tear 17 miles of it down, 130 structures, three interstate junctions and eight interchanges, and we need to do it all at the same time. But I want to make some commitments to you. First, we will keep the traffic flowing during construction. Second, I've been told this will take 10 years. We'll do it in five, and we'll be done before the Olympics. And when we're done, there'll be no more traffic congestion and the economy will continue to grow. Now, I want to confess to you, I was worried. I, this was clearly the biggest risk, professionally, politically, or financially, that I had ever taken. And I must also say the reaction was not uniformly positive. You might see some parallels in healthcare here. The construction industry, they were very unsettled by this because, frankly, they had counted on 12 years of work under a business model they fully understood. Uh, the people, um, the people, well, you know how dramatic it seemed for me to go on TV? The truth is none of them were paying any attention. However, they were paying attention when the off-ramp started to come down and their commute was disrupted. And I must confess, they, as well, they got a little grumpy at times. But they amused themselves by developing a lot of freeway humor. Uh, there was one place where the traffic management looked a lot like a tunnel. And you went through it fast with very little room on either side. And it became affectionately known as Levitt's Luge. <laughs> uh, but let me jump to the end. It was estimated that it would take 10 years. We promised five. In 4.6 years, the project was finished. We had estimated it would be $2 billion. The final cost was $1.59 billion. All 50 million of the incentives had been paid out because motorists were kept, for the most part, happy. They were on time, and they met the standards. It was a spectacular success. Tom Warren, who I introduced you to by picture, is the hero of this, a great piece of leadership. Best value, best value, a term we will talk about today is not simply a concept of healthcare, it is an economic principle and it worked. Design build now has been adapted or adopted around the country. Now, we're here to talk about best value, but in the context of healthcare, not roads. 
But healthcare has a dilemma that is very similar to that which we faced in the story I just related to you. People are going to get sick and people need help, but the current economic model simply won't work. So our system is being forced to innovate. There is very clear evidence that we are moving now to a new system of payment, and we all know it as risk-based payment or, or value care, and it involves risk. It's as though a giant voice from the cosmos, a combination of economists and consumers are chanting value, value, value. The big question now is not will we move to value, the question is how and how fast. So I want to talk about five key attributes, as I indicated, who, who, uh, that are possessed by organizations that we perceive are moving down this track successfully. Number one, and that is leadership. I introduced you to Tom Warren. Tom Warren, in my judgment, in, our, in this highway episode, showed two very important attributes that must be, avail must be present. One is he had the skill to explain in terms that were simple enough that people could understand not just what was happening, but why. He could turn believers into, uh, he could, uh, doubters into believers. The second is that he committed himself. He showed an act of leadership by taking on risk himself in an atmosphere that made very clear he was committed to this. The healthcare system, leaders across the healthcare system who are successfully now transitioning show the same, must show, in my view, the same kind of commitment. They have to have communication skills that allow them to explain it simply enough that people understand why it's happening and what to expect, and they need to be clear that they're making the commitment for themselves and their entire organization. Key number two, the entire organization has to go through a change in culture. Back to my friend Tom Warren, I remember a senior engineer telling me one day how hard it was for him to get a custom after 25 years as a highway engineer in not inspecting everything and not having complete control over every aspect of the job. There were skeptics when they started, but back to his communication skills, this was about getting the entire organization, not just for a project, but to begin to think about things differently. In healthcare, with risk-based payment, this represents very serious change. Fee-for-service is a culture of healthcare. It is not just a payment method. It is the culture of healthcare. And it's not going to change quickly, but it has to change. Payers that are driving this change are, 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 are now bringing motivation to it. I was interested to watch the, to see the CMS uh, bundled payment rule uh, that was uh, issued last week. 175 markets now with, with joint replacement are mandated to be involved in bundled payment. Now there'll be a year for them to, for everyone to get accustomed to that idea, but I believe that this is an example of a government payer, and we're seeing with, with, uh, with, with the private uh, payers are very clearly beginning to move to change the culture of healthcare. Number three, expect innovation. Risk and innovation are partners. So another story from my friend Tom Warren. He came to me one day and said, I want to pay all of the bidders one million dollars. I said, even the losers? I want to pay every bidder a million dollars because I want to own their ideas. We're after best value, and if we don't pay them, we won't be able to use their ideas. I, that to me seemed like an outrageous idea. 
But it became, it was literally brilliant. As it turns out, the idea that allowed for the traffic management to work actually came from a losing bidder. This is a situation where Warren expected innovation and he drove innovation by setting up a system where it was required. Here's the reason. Risk leads to necessity. Necessity leads to innovation and innovation produces value. Key number four, add new competencies. Now, back to the highway situation. There were people at the Department of Transportation who could have written a low bid contract in their sleep. They had done it for 50 years. But the process of writing and negotiating a best value contract was an entirely new competency. In healthcare, we have the same requirement. We have been in a system where we have been grinding and negotiating rates between pi uh, payers and, and providers for decades. The new competency is the ability to find the convergence, to find the value, to understand analytics, to practice patterns, risk management, for payers to understand providers and providers to understand the culture of payers. These are new competencies. Number five, align incentives. Now, there, are two, there were two keys to success, in my judgment, that, for Tom Warren. One was the 15-year warranty. So the builders were building quality for themselves, not for the state. And the second was the $50 million bonus. I, t I thought it was outrageous, but when it came down to it, it met our priorities and it saved us money. It was aligning innovation with incentives. Healthcare, we are not yet as good as we must be in aligning our incentives. Uh, one of the things I've observed is that we continue to pay doctors and managers on a fee-for-service incentive system while we're negotiating agreements on a value basis. Many providers even own an insurance company, but in that case, they still pay their doctors on a fee-for-service basis. Real integration, real innovation will come when we begin to see all of the incentives aligned. So the five key points. Leadership is a requirement. Change in culture is a necessity. You can expect innovation if you empower it. You have to add new competencies and you have to align incentives. Now, in the next few hours or t between the next 24 hours, we will have four sessions. We'll talk about risk, we'll talk about investment, we'll talk about alliance building, and we'll talk about value. We welcome you to Salt Lake City. We want to stimulate new thinking in you and also have you meet some new people. But before I finish today, tonight, I, today, I want to just tell one more story. One more Olympic story. This is an Olympic torch. It carried the Olympic flame. I treasure the fact that it's still got ashes from the Olympic flame. Um, the Olympic flame actually originated in Olympia, Greece. You will see a picture of, the, of a ceremony in Olympia, Greece, where each Olympic season, the Olympic flame is lighted. Now, what is not known to many is that the flame is actually the sun. You can see the concave bowl that is where the fire is. That's actually a concave bowl that is designed to capture the rays of the sun, and the heat creates a spontaneous combustion from the sun, and the Olympic flame is attached to the torch. And that begins the Olympic torch relay. For 13,000 miles with 12,000 runners through 46 states 
and 300 communities. This torch is run. With each runner in the relay igniting the torch of the next, thousands of people line the streets. One day I was riding with the organizer of the Torchery Life. I said, look at this. 10,000 people on the sides of the street, essentially to see fire on a stick. What, what am I missing? She said to me, Governor, you're missing the point. I could tell you a hundred stories. Let me tell you one. Two weeks ago, we had a gap in the relay. I sent my assistant ahead. She went to a school, saw the school, the school's secretary and said, I need a runner. Can you find me a student? Don't give me the student body president. Give me somebody who needs a lift. Within a few minutes, they were draping an Olympic uniform on an undersized fifth grader. And within 30 minutes, he was running the torch with the Olympic flame, surrounded by tens of thousands of people and his schoolmates. Two days later, there was another email from the assistant to the school secretary, thanking her for what a glorious experience it had been. And then, speaking of the lonely fifth grader, she ended with this statement, he doesn't sit alone anymore. So, as you look at the Olympic flame and think about it, this is not just a flame. It is the aspiration of what makes people good. It's friendship, it's respect, it's excellence, and it's fairness. So over the next 24 hours, as we talk about risk and about investment and about alliances and about value, Let's not think about it in the context of money. Let it be about the best aspiration for what we can be. Let it be about every American having better health care. Thank you.